This is episode 218 of the Rio Grande Foundation's Tipping Point New Mexico. I'm Paul Guessing, president of the Rio Grande Foundation, New Mexico's free market think tank. You can find out more about the foundation at riograndefoundation.org. I am very pleased to be joined this week by Amity Schlaes. She is an author of numerous books, including The Forgotten Man, about the uh, New Deal and the Great Depression. She also wrote an excellent book about Calvin Coolidge. And today we're pr primarily going to be discussing her newest book, Great Society, A New History. Welcome to Tipping Point New Mexico, Amity. Well, I'm glad to be back with you, Paul. Yeah, you came out to New Mexico for uh, as part of your tour relating to the Calvin Coolidge book a few years ago. And uh, we'll definitely touch on a little bit of Coolidge and maybe what he would be thinking these days about the current political situation in our nation. But uh, yeah, just tell us a little bit about yourself. And I know you do uh, some work with the Calvin Coolidge Project. So maybe talk a little bit about how you're working to continue Coolidge's legacy. The Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation is the foundation that honors Calvin Coolidge, the 30th president. Our emphasis though, or and, is teaching young people Coolidge values. They don't have to buy those values, but at least to expose them to the way the president thought and the way many people thought um, in that era and, and actually afterward. Coolidge believed in civility, he believed in debate, he believed in bipartisan work, he believed in restrained federal government, he believed uh, in states. He actually said, I'm paraphrasing here, but um, not about New Mexico, but vis-a-vis um, -vis Arizona, the United States are inviolate only in so far as Arizona is inviolate. That is, states make up the union, it's not the United States. And the United States can't be without states. It's, um, so he was a, a serious federalist. Um, he was also a president who actually cut the budget, not, and, and you're wondering if I mean reduce the increase. No, I mean cut the budget. Uh, when Coolidge left office after 67 months, the budget was smaller than when he came in, in real and nominal terms. So. He's, he's amazing. Um, he uh, vetoed entitlements a few times, what we would call entitlements. We can talk about that. And what we do at Coolidge is um, we give a wonderful scholarship and we, we help kids to learn about Coolidge. We have an office in Washington and a beautiful one in Plymouth Notch, Vermont, where he was born. And anyone who wants to help children learn about a great hero president, he is a hero um, who had a different style and who never showed off, um, send uh, your your letters to us, contact us. And how would they do that? How would, will people find out about uh, that organization and uh, possibly get involved or support it? You absolutely can. There are many ways to get involved. The Coolidge Foundation um, has a new project, which is building Coolidge's virtual library. Uh, we Coolidge doesn't have a library because he really didn't like to be funded by the federal government. He didn't think former presidents should take that money. And as our listeners know, part of the story with the federal presidential libraries is that the government provides the librarians and the library work. Coolidge wouldn't have had that. So his, his things, his ephemera are all over the place, including at a wonderful library in Northampton, Mass, and so on. Uh, where he uh, spent his career as an attorney and a young politician. At the Coolidge Foundation, we're pulling all the documents together um, to have the Coolidge Virtual Library. We just, I'm excited because today we just uh, uncovered about hundreds of videos we never knew existed uh, of Coolidge, actual footage. Um, we're putting that online and the way to get involved is not just to give money, but we will hire you to be a virtual editor of a Coolidge document. That is to check it over and to write your own commentary about why that document is important. Um, so we uh, assign what we're uploading for review by our friends. We also um, have the Coolidge scholarship, which is a full ride scholarship to any college. So that's 
three hundred thousand dollars a child, um, and you're invited uh, to to contact us if you're interested in judging that scholarship, for example, because judging the scholarship is a way to get to know Coolidge scholars, Coolidge program students, and and the institution, and it's very fun to help a child get a scholarship. All right. Well, uh, I don't want to totally leave Calvin Coolidge. I know you've got a new book, and I also want to contextualize it with your prior book about the Great Depression. But before we leave Calvin Coolidge entirely, you mentioned federalism. And in some ways, arguably, the COVID-19 outbreak that we've seen has reinvigorated federalism in a sense that governors have really shown uh, their true colors and stripes by responding to the COVID-19 uh, crisis. But uh, contrary to uh, the Coolidge era and Coolidge's philosophy, we've seen an absolute ballooning of the federal budget. And then kind of as a third component of this, when Coolidge was governor of Massachusetts, he took aggressive action to quell civil unrest. And it seems like these days, uh, especially in blue states, there's a lot of civil unrest going on that has not been answered by the powers that be. So kind of giving you a menu option, I'm not expecting detailed answers on all three of those, but any of those that you specifically find interesting contrasts or comparisons between the current era and uh, Coolidge's time. Well, federalism is a phrase that's been much abused. So when federalism means the federal government sends you your state money so you feel more powerful because you, the governor, can spend more, I'm not sure that's truly federalism, but since Nixon and even before uh, in the New Deal, um, that was sort of the, the trade. The president or Washington would pay lip service to the concept of federalism, even as it weakened the authority of local local um, governors or mayors by making their jurisdiction dependent on Washington money instead of their own. And, and as we know, once you're dependent on Washington money, you're a different animal than you are if you're living on the state budget. It's kind of Faustian bargain that governors make very often. I am a, a disaster area. I am lying here uh, supine prone, come rescue me federal government, that's not really federalism, right? Federalism is that the states are very important and the United States, the Washington government less so. So, so in the time of cool is just to answer one question. Um, clever people have asked me about this this week. Sometimes the police now are feeling like they might wanna go on strike. They don't like the circumstances in which they have to work. They don't like what's being said about them. Coolidge uh, had policemen when he was governor of Massachusetts by a quirk of Massachusetts jurisdiction. The governor was in charge of the Boston police um, who went on strike and they had very good reasons to strike. Um, they had rats in the station house. They were paid insufficiently due to unacknowledged inflation. They were tired from World War I where they'd been soldiers or worked over time and they were seriously underpaid, but they were breaking their contract when they went on strike in Boston and cool. And there were riots in Boston. You can call them what you like, but that's what they were. Windows were broken and people broke into the Starbucks. Oops, I mean the coffee shop. But anyway, the Starbucks of that era was broken into. Uh, little businessmen were afraid and tried to get gun licenses. There was a race in the commercial district for the retailers to get gun licenses. That sounds familiar too. This was also considered appalling um, because we live in a civil, not an armed society it, downtown usually. Uh, and Coolidge said, um, dear policemen, you cannot strike. You are striking, so you are fired. There is no right to strike against the public safety by anybody, anywhere, any time. There were no police unions at that time in the sense we have them today. He saw an inherent conflict in unionization and the public sector. He didn't believe that public sector employees should be unionized. The union ends up fighting the people whom the public servants are supposed to be serving in the Coolidge uh, thought tr train of thought. 
so this went on and it was a very brutal, brutal event. It's very hard to fire a policeman. It's very hard to have riots of which Coolidge did not approve, of course. Um, the riots were much inspired by foreigners. In that instance, um, I'm thinking actually of what was going on in Ireland um, and the, the changes there. That inspired the uh, very Irish American population of Boston uh, to rise up. Uh, that was not okay when they did damage to uh, other people's property. And um, the whole handling of it, particularly Coolidge's decision to fire the policemen, who were, by the way, his constituents, he was famous for getting the Irish American vote, um, was a tough one, uh, but he felt it was important. President Wilson of the, the other party paid attention to it. Harding paid attention to it. And it, it, Coolidge's uh, brave and frightening move, brave and dawning move, um, definitely put him um, onto the presidential ticket. It, it elevated him from governor and catapulted him into national prominence because other politicians in municipalities began to say, no public sector employees can't strike and no, there can be no riots. Uh, there's great sorrow, there's great unhappiness, there are things that must change, but rioting is not the way to save cities. So that's the Coolidge example. Um, uh, and uh, it's worth talking about. It, it inspired Ronald Reagan. Uh, some of your viewers, listeners will have heard of PATCO, the big air traffic controller um, union, which struck under Reagan. Again, a group very much loved who cannot like an air traffic controller. He works hard and saves lives or she does. Um, Reagan also fired the air traffic controllers because they too breached their contract. Yeah, that, a lot of parallels and uh, lessons, including uh, police unions and uh, their potentially negative impacts. And uh, I just commend folks to read your uh, prior book about Calvin Coolidge. And we could sit here all day and talk about Coolidge and his legacy, but you do have a new book. So we're going to have to shift gears into great society, a new history. Now, uh, you know, we have an educated audience, I'm sure, but uh, how would you define the Great Society? Is it exclusively programs from Lyndon Johnson and his administration? W were there other Great Society programs that maybe weren't related to him that maybe came from John F. Kennedy or, or whatever? Is a Great Society exclusively a, a Johnson project? And talk about what those really are, uh, because many of them survive today. Well, thank you. It starts with idealism, right? So now young people feel idealistic, so do older people very often. A mood of idealism has come over us. We don't want a little change, we want great change. And that was very similar in the early 60s. They didn't call it the good society. They called it the great society. Um, and I, even though the phrase goes with Lyndon Johnson, and I'll explain that very briefly, but it started, the ambition started for greatness, uh, did come out of Kennedy. You think of the space race. Kennedy was um, very judicious about his race to greatness. He thought the space race was fine because it inspired people, and might scare the Russians. Um, but he also believed in the private sector. And the question always is, if you wanna get to great, who's gonna get you there faster or better? The private sector or the public sector. In the case of Lyndon Johnson, when he came along, um, he definitely believed in the public sector. Over and over again in the 1960s, we, we declared ourselves um, eager to get to great and we declared the vehicle the public sector. So Johnson gave a speech at the University of Michigan and he kind of talked it around elsewhere, this phrase, great society. He said, countryside, cities, classrooms. He had three C's for the Great Society. And um, mainly what's important for us to remember is he promised to cure poverty. He didn't say make poverty a little better. There was nothing incremental about it. He said cure, C-U-R-E. Uh, he really wanted race equality now. Um, and uh, to be frank, and in the book I go into this, Nixon continued Johnson policy and in, in some areas, actually accelerated spending. One example would be food stamps. Why would Nixon, who's supposed to be a Republican, do that? The reason he did it was he was a weak president. Congress wasn't always with him. And he, like Bill Clinton, believed in triangulation and sort of figuring out the middle uh, 
and having a big tent, whatever metaphor you want to use, to get as many um, political streams uh, in his school so that he could have an effect. Um, Nixon also believed basically that domestic policy was a negotiable relative to um, farm policy, his area of strength and interest. So he was gonna give a lot in domestic policy to Democrats, to anyone, in order to buy time to pursue his Vietnam and China policies. Therefore, he permitted the Great Society to expand. And the Great Society programs that we know today are primarily Medicare and Medicaid, but uh, talk a little bit about some of the ways that the Great Society still is very much in effect. Well, let's talk about Medicare and Medicaid because those are the sort of untouchables. I know you must have senior citizens in your audience. Um, Medicare, well, that's the least bad thing, right? That's what we say. And at the time, this is the 60s, when Medicare was created, one of the people who early on imposed it was Ronald Reagan, before, you know, in the time he was just becoming governor of California, because he thought it would socialize the United States. And at that time, there were members of the AMA, American Medical Association, also said, this is socialism. And, and when we learned about this in school, we, we thought that was absurd, right? Because, well, Medicare is expensive, but it's, it's the least dislikable of of some of the health programs we have. That was always the attitude that I, that I heard. Um, nowadays, like right this sec, you can see the damage of Medicare. Why? Medicare has converted an entrepreneurial and professional group of people, class of people, healthcare providers into socialists, into people who are very dependent on government payment with scant um, regard for enterprise or alternate, alternate, um, you know, uh, even alternate technologies. Of course, there are a few exceptions and a lot of us invest in those companies, but generally doctors believe in a collective system because our Medicare and Medicaid have trained them to do so. So you have very intelligent people who believe in authority over the collective and are very self-righteous about it. Well, that affected COVID, didn't it, for example? I, I just wonder what COVID would have been like without Medicare and uh, without sort of Medicaid too. So if you say, is America socialist today? Um, one answer could be, well, some sectors are, and one is healthcare by and large. It's already mentally socialist. It thinks in aggregates. It thinks about government funds. It doesn't think too much about the individual. It thinks about the protocol, ventilator, um, and it turns painfully slowly. Uh, so that is a legacy of the Great Society, the socialized healthcare, I won't say socialist, but socialized healthcare that turned out to be um, very relevant today. Of course, when I wrote this book in, you know, years ago, I, I, I didn't pay too much attention to Medicare except for its impact on the federal budget. But this sort of mental attitude is important. Other programs that would be relevant now when you're looking at the cities, in the 1960s then, um, just as now, there was a great desire to avert riots in cities or unrest, whatever you would like to call what goes on. Um, and uh, more progressive people thought the answer was to create community action, new municipal institutions, clubs, movements that would make the citizens feel empowered the old world, which would be the police of the city or the mayor, well, that was yesterday. Those people were bigots. Community action will be the answer. And that was the progressive view. And the, the progressive view said the federal government should fund the community action. Talk about false federalism, right? Um, and uh, that'll be all right. And people who were less excited about a progressive revolution in their town went along. Why? Because they thought maybe that would stop the riots, lesser evil. Community action was a disaster in the 1960s. The sidelining of the police and the mayors was a disaster. In the case of Watts, for example, you can argue the evidence is plain as day that the community action programs of the war on poverty actually helped to cause Watts. They came before um, because the community action people, which would be uh, Sergeant Shriver's Office of Economic Opportunity, got into a terrible tangle with Mayor Yorty of LA, 
and the result was the money wasn't spent or was spent the wrong way. And people were very disappointed because once they hear a large amount of money is coming for community action or for jobs or for summer programs, and it doesn't, well, that is a way to set up a riot. Um, in Detroit, there was a large amount of funding for community action, which did not stop the Detroit riots, which came later and were so terrible. So the thing that we would talk about this week, I think, is community action and that it's um, an exciting idea, federally funded community action, helping people get the vote, helping people get better housing, building better housing, all that. But in reality, um, it's a uh, counterproductive intrusion on the locale, particularly in the north, and may even worsen the problem it purports to alleviate. Yeah, uh, well, does that make sense? That, that does make sense. I, I want to kick it back to healthcare momentarily and just uh, there's a study from the American Journal of Public Health uh, that cites 2013 data, which the federal government uh, accounts for 64.3% of US healthcare spending. That's again in 2013. So I can only imagine that now we're well above the two thirds threshold uh, in terms of federal government spending on healthcare of the, of the total. And of course that is driven by those two programs we cited from the Great Society, Medicare and Medicaid. Now, you mentioned the impact that they had on COVID-19, uh, but kind of, you're talking about the historical aspects of this. What drove those in the Great Society? Why the push for greater and greater federal involvement in healthcare for seniors, Medicare, and healthcare for the less uh, well-off in the form of Medicaid? And why are these such you know, flashpoint issues. Why is this such a problem uh, right now? And in general, since the Great well, let's, Society, let's that we've been debating Medicare. Where, where they were then. I'm sorry, I cut you. Like, where they were in the time, right? In the time, many people had moved to cities from the country. Families were not together the way they had been. So senior citizens needed more help because they couldn't ask their daughter. They couldn't live with their daughter or their son very often. They lived in apartments. Um, urban renewal, which was a great federal intervention of the decade earlier and divided families too. And we can talk about that. So many old people didn't have enough money for healthcare. And by the way, another factor very important is expectations of what healthcare could deliver were already rising. Lyndon Johnson didn't expect to live to 70. Um, he certainly didn't expect to live to 75. So Medicare, he didn't expect anyone else to. I don't have the data right in front of me, but life expectancy was far lower at that time. Let me, so let me, they thought Medicare might be something you would need for five years and then you would pass away. Right, I've read- um, They didn't think 20 years on Medicare. It was beyond their imagination or 30. So some of this, I, I think um, this is an example of a very well-intentioned program put together with a lot of love where the authors had no idea what they're doing. I mean, Medicare and Medicaid were almost add-ons to a social security law, the way they were considered, the time they got when they were passed. They were trade-offs for Vietnam War spending. They were, they were, right? Mm -hmm. So nobody really got what they were doing or that it would bust the budget, um, the federal budget now, or that our children would not get health care because we gave ourselves, us near senior citizens, senior citizens, so much healthcare from the public purse. So, so none of this, I think it's mainly a story of unintended consequences. And it, it, when you go back and look at the doctors such as Ronald Reagan's father-in-law who fought this, they don't seem quaint and old, well, nasty cold warriors. They seem prescient. Uh, so that's different from what you learn about in school, right? Uh, they, they, you know, a doctor is actually an entrepreneur in addition to being a professional. And when you ensnare him in a paper system or a computer system where he's chained to a database, um, you reduce his productivity as well. You, you, you wreck a trade and you wreck, um, you know, the quality of what, what's going to the patients from the trade by socializing. And none of that was foreseen.
um, by most of the, but maybe by the AMA, but not by most of the lawmakers who thought Medicare sounded just dandy. Medicaid, likewise. Yeah, um, speaking again about Lyndon Johnson and uh, his personal legacy and all this, uh, I've read all of or most of the Caro books about him and he, uh, his dad had heart issues and passed away relatively young and Johnson had a heart attack when he was, I believe, Senate Majority Leader. Uh, so he definitely had a short time horizon uh, in addition to all the, you know, actuarial data showing that people just lived less uh, you know, time at that at that particular time in our history. So health expenses weren't necessarily seen for decades as you know, people living on the federal uh, programs. We're casualties of our own success in part. And even then, um, you know, I started to say, and I, I didn't say it very accurately, but expectations were rising because in the 60s, you know, we, we had only, in the 50s, we had only figured out the value of antibiotics. We had only really, you know, the polio vaccine became a fact of life. Um, so all of a sudden, and I think this is important too, I often write about this um, and have in Europe, Americans had a sense of immortality that, that maybe we can live a lot longer, maybe forever. And they still do. They, you get, in the United States, you always get the feeling people feel they're entitled to immortality. Uh, well, we can't give them that as much as we would like to. And that, that was part of it too. If, if antibiotics can make all infections go away and polio is gone um, and there was no AIDS on the horizon yet, none of the, the newer diseases, it, it, there was a sense of the possibility of immortality, which is very important. Well, there, even in addition to that or piling onto that, it, I, I think there was a vision of the competency of government in solving our problems that uh, existed at that time. I mean, we came off of winning World War II, one of the greatest you know, moments, I guess, in American history, government, uh, then sending people to the moon. And how many times do you hear today, we need a moonshot for dot, dot, dot. Uh, so everybody, not everybody, but the zeitgeist was uh, government can solve all of our problems, specifically uh, our generous, benevolent Washington, D.C. federal government. And, uh, you know, that attitude had to permeate virtually all of the great society. It also permeated the Vietnam War, but we were quickly uh, rebuked in that. So I just. You it, know, what I think is important is a presidential scholarship an emphasis on presidential biography, and I can say this because I am a presidential biographer, can be a trap. Presidents are navigating currents at best. Their, their decisions matter greatly, but they're navigating currents. So in, um, for example, The Best and the Brightest, David Halberston wrote about the people who worked around Kennedy and Johnson who were navigating the Vietnam War. This book, The Great Society, is a domestic best and the brightest. It's not so much about Johnson, Nixon, or Kennedy, though I mentioned them, as about the men, and they were all men, who work for those guys, who work for the presidents, and who were tortured to such an extent by the hypocrisy of their own work and their own personal weaknesses and their inability to promulgate policy they really believed was correct because all government is compromised. Um, and so I focused on them. And like the best and the brightest in the Halberstam book, what they did have in common, and they were all fairly lovable people, is an incredible sense of their own self-worth. I'm a genius. I went to, I led a big auto company. Think of uh, Romney, for example. I'm very brilliant and started the Peace Corps. I'm speaking of George Romney, by the way. Um, I'm McNamara. I led another auto company, uh, Sergeant Shriver. I, I, I'm so proud. I, I founded the Peace Corps. They thought they were infallible. The, the, there was so this domestic best and the brightest had no notion of the possibility of failure, and they also thought they'd enjoy goodwill for a longer period than they did. There's a lot of pouting, right? A lot of people who tried hard and nobody appreciated them. And they were unaccustomed to that. A lot of narcissism and a lot of programs uh, that 
you know, very little respect for human nature, for the individual, for the desires of the individual, and therefore foundered. Uh, one of the high points of my book in terms of sorrow, pity, and just sheer ludicrousness is uh, McNamara, the former defense secretary who became head of the World Bank, he failed up, um, going to Notre Dame, a Catholic school, to preach on the virtue of population control, to preach of the virtue. What hubris, to use a Greek word, I don't know the Catholic word, what chutzpah, to use the Jewish word, that you're telling people who've thought about this issue a lot more than you probably have, how the world is, should be. Uh, and um, that was them. They, they made some major errors. There was a great uh, sort of zero growth culture um, what's called the Club of Rome. There were people like uh, Paul Ehrlich going around saying the world's going to collapse by the 80s. Um, there were so many miscalculations by so many supposed geniuses that, that it's hard to write them all down. Um, and I, I wrote about all these people because, as I say, they were lovable. They really wanted to do well. Um, they just didn't. Right. And... Uh... You know, government failure is an inherent part of the great society. And you talked about, you know, we can see it from our perspective, certainly with regard to the healthcare system and the doctors and the very dramatic changes, even during my lifetime, in terms of the way doctors are seen as opposed to being traditionally a more entrepreneurial mindset now they're very much part of these these big systems and they're at the behest of the insurance companies but uh, talk about other aspects of the great society and the way that they've transformed our society and you know I think the one that I uh, you know it comes down to uh, in my mind is uh, the breakdown of the family and the welfare system and uh, you know, we had some reforms in 94, uh, or was it 95? Anyway, the Clinton era reforms, uh, but those programs still loom large and what they did to American families uh, also looms That's large. That's right. Well, it's, you know, welfare, this is, as I say, when you say federalism, you have to always think what you mean. A lot of welfare policy was decided by states. A lot of states thought that dads should not be encouraged to stop working. Therefore, public housing was available, sometimes funded by the federal government, but managed often by the states, but only families that had no dad could get the apartments in the public housing. It turned out the public housing at the beginning was so attractive that families broke up. That's something that happened before the Great Society. That happened as a result of state welfare policy and urban renewal, which kind of distorted the housing market in this way and also hurt families by bulldozing their homes to build the new buildings in the cities, the projects. So all that was going on. The, the, the Great Society then, so it's a little bit um, of, a, of a wrong assumption to think that welfare came from the Great Society. It didn't. It, but the Great Society, um, while generally aware of the flaws of what it was doing, one thinks of Daniel Patrick Moynihan saying we were feeding the horses to feed the sparrows, by which Senator Moynihan meant we were feeding the social workers, not the poor people, with all our funding of welfare. The Great Society, nonetheless, it, with all its self-awareness, actually cemented welfare, made it stronger, made payments stronger. One example would be food stamps, which grew tremendously under Nixon. So you get people um, accustomed to getting money from the government in a way that they hadn't been before. Poverty becomes a concept. It was less of a concept. If you go back to the economic reports of the presidents of the 1950s, you don't see much talk of poverty, even under Kennedy. But it becomes a quantifiable and quantified concept. Um, Kennedy, John, and the Kennedy, Johnson. So um, Martin Luther King said uh, at one point, "We didn't know we were poor until you told us." To uh, um, to uh, maybe I don't know who it was to, but maybe the Kennedys or Walter Ruther of the unions. 
anyhow, what happened was it was all institutionalized. There was also a legal change. The legal change was um, the concept of the entitlement that you are entitled to the entitlement that it is not at the discretion of the government office, whether it gives you the money or not. There were some famous cases um, that I describe in the book where welfare, um, and this sounds like now, um, to began to be treated as property, just like um, income from a patent would be the property of the author of the patent. That was totally new. So we kind of cemented the, uh, the welfare culture with the Great Society and then expanded it. Now, maybe I, I don't know my history that well on welfare programs that preceded the Great Society. Were those mostly federally funded or state funded? Because you know, one of, we talked about federalism and you know, there's a big difference between state funding of these programs on their own and having to pay that out of real money that the state provides as opposed to where we are now, which is just put it on the credit card from Washington. Right. And states like New Mexico, which uh, of course here, the whole idea of getting federal dollars is seen by many, certainly on the left, but even some on the right as an economic development tool where if we can fleece the federal government for more money from other taxpayers and other states or uh, debt, then we're somehow developing our economy. Uh, was that- One of the things about the 60s, I, I'm gonna talk about the second part of it. The relationship between federal welfare spending and state welfare spending is interesting, but this is more interesting, I think, Paul. Remember, the military industrial establishment really existed and continues to exist to some extent in New Mexico, right? Uh, that is the government and defense, uh, they were a large part of the economy. Um, Ike warned about that. He's the one who talked about the complex, the military industrial complex and warned against it just as he was leaving office. And what's wonderful about the 60s is industries such as electronics and aeronautics realized in the 60s, maybe they didn't have to be dependent on the federal government. That was a new development. What am I talking about? Um, Fairchild, for example, um, which was essentially with the people who would then leave Intel. They realized, wait a minute, Gordon Moore, that maybe consumers would buy what they made. They weren't just gonna be making for Boeing or the space program or various weapons, right? Um, and that was a huge epiphany for a creative class, which is um, the intellectuals who were in those industries, the engineers, oh, you might not have to work for the government. Um, I've, I've talked with Homer Hickam about this, the man it, it, you know, in October Sky, the rocket boy. It, it, where else can you work besides the government? Nowhere, if you're a fabulous engineer, except for maybe at a company like GE, which serves the government. So it's sort of an arm of the government or Boeing. Um, suddenly they realized they could make things people wanted to buy that had nothing to do with the government, with eventually the personal computer. And those companies were such interesting places because of this epiphany. Example, New Mexico, which I never knew, maybe you did, and may, you can correct this narrative, maybe I'm missing a fact or two, but, but uh, Fairchild wanted to do something for Native Americans. And it got involved um, in Shiprock, New Mexico and created a factory for chip making, employing Native Americans. It's it, uh, and why why did that work? Well, the Native Americans in Shiprock were apparently good at needlework or very small work, so they they were accustomed to working with tiny things, and chips are tiny things. You need a magnifying glass. You sit there, and they felt they had a success with this little Fairchild factory in Shiprock. Later, it fell apart in part because radical unions demanded very high pay, the whole place got politicized. Um, and there was a writer I discovered when I was writing my book who wrote about Fairchild and this little uh, factory experiment which became the greatest single private sector employer of Native Americans in the United States for a time. Um, her name is Lisa Nakamura. 
Um, and she, one of her articles is in the Computer History Museum. Anyway, why does that matter besides New Mexico matters? Um, it shows all the possibilities that the private sector was beginning to discover. And the private sector also sought to be great. Greatness, you could be in the public sector, you could be in the private sector, both wanted a great society. And what I discovered in researching this book was that the private sector was way better at getting to great than its reputation would suggest. And, uh, you know, I really also enjoyed writing about Toyota and the way that it challenged um, the big three. Uh, Toyota opened the mind of the auto consumer, as did some of the Germans, Volkswagen, for example. They opened the mind to the potential for quality of, of craftsmanship, a car door that doesn't have to be double hard slammed for you to close it, right? Um, all, these, all these changes um, came because of companies. And so the, the Great Society book is the story of government officials who try hard, but don't always succeed, usually fail, and private sector uh, companies that succeed better than anyone imagines at improving the quality of life, the standard of living, and in innovating. Well, uh, I was not familiar with the Fairchild plant in Shiprock, New Mexico, but it's definitely relevant to the current situation, of course, uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, Shiprock is native, uh, is Navajo uh, area. And during the COVID-19 situation, uh, Navajo, at least especially early on uh, here in New Mexico, was one of the hardest hit groups in the entire country. And they're... Uh, challenges with regard to basic services like running water, all those things uh, were definitely factors in that situation. And many on the left are saying, oh, you know, we need more and more money from the federal government, of course, poured into the Navajo uh, area. They don't talk about prior uh, efforts like the Fairchild uh, situation where they were actually employing Navajo providing incomes for them, et cetera. And I'll have to read up a little bit more on that and uh, possibly do a uh, errors of enchantment blog post, but uh, uh, fascinating history there. And thank you for highlighting that. Amity, we well, only- you will know more than we do about it. It's your state. Um, right. But I was very, it, you know, it all got, um, I was very interested, you know, the, the problem is not COVID. Any terrible illness will disproportionately affect the poor because True. they're more vulnerable. The problem is the leftists are right. Why people are that still that poor? And that has not been answered. Um, but what has been answered is that further federal spending does not seem to end that poverty. The, the motto of my book is nothing is new, it's just forgotten. Uh, you know, the reason young people are so excited about spending or even socialism is they forgot what happened in the Great Society or the New Deal. Right. They never knew it. Uh, we helped them forget it with our terrible neglect of their education, apparently. And uh, real quick, uh, I, and I really need a concise answer from you. You talk, you, you said forgotten, and uh, it brings to mind your private book about the Great Depression and the Forgotten Man, kind of put the Great Society and the New Deal into context uh, briefly, if you can. Where where do they have similarities and what are the, some of the big differences in the way they impacted uh, politics and policy in America moving forward? Well, when you have a war, you always have a collective impulse. I hope you've had Robert Higgs on. But in the in the New Deal was the first peacetime national progressive push of a, of a giant scale. Um, it wasn't finished though, it got interrupted in a way by, by World War II and uh, kind of reconsideration. Um, so Johnson said, I'm gonna finish the New Deal through the Great Society. So you think of Great Society as part two of Roosevelt's New Deal. 
One big distinction, however, which gets at now, uh, Johnson is more similar to now, is the New Deal got started when we had 25% unemployment. The Great Society got started when we had almost no unemployment as today. So the Great Society in that way is more relevant. It's out of idealism. The idea that we've solved our economy, let's do more. That was very um, much the attitude in the 60s and it is now. Well, thank you very much for your time today, Amity. Again, it's Great Society, A New History. It is available where fine books are sold, Amazon, et cetera, uh, Tuesday, August the 4th. So if you order it now, it'll be uh, very, oh, sorry, that's when it's uh, it'll be arriving, but it's in uh, bookstores and on Amazon right now. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for your time. And we'll put that in the show notes. Thanks for listening to this week's show. Make sure to get the latest edition of Tipping Point New Mexico by subscribing at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify. You can post or comment on this and other episodes on Facebook and Twitter and tell Google Home to play Tipping Point New Mexico. Thanks to Path3 Marketing for producing this show.